Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the third day of PPCS 2014. Uh, my name is Christian Terboven. I'm working here at the IT Center. I'm the deputy head of this HPC group. And uh, today we're talking about OpenMP. So we start with an introduction into OpenMP. Uh, we start immediately now and we go for something like one and a half hour. Then we have a coffee break again. And then we have some time for uh, labs. So we prepared some exercises. They're being printed at the moment so that you can immediately start to try out all the different uh, things that we talked about in this session. Then after the lunch break, Ruth van der Paas from Oracle will take over and he will talk about, oh, this one again, and he will talk about performance tuning uh, in OpenMP. And uh, then we have another break and in the afternoon I will talk again about some uh, advanced uh, topics. Who has some experience with OpenMP already? A few hands, okay. So I will start with an introduction, but I will cover pretty much most of the important things that you need in, in order to write important, or well, not important, but in order to write fully functional OpenMP programs. And in the afternoon, you will hear about what we think are the most important uh, performance problems and how to address them. So the goal of this day is really to equip you with a working set or with a set of, of techniques and some knowledge so that from there on you can work on your own programs and uh, teach you the remaining aspects of OpenMP yourself. We will also have some guidance on, on uh, literature as well as uh, some reference documentation uh, on the web. And again, this an, is an invitation for you if you have any questions in between, please feel free to ask them. And uh, also in the labs, if you have questions, even if they do not relate to the lab exercises, but OpenMP in general, take the opportunity uh, to talk to me or my colleagues. We are here uh, to help you. And I will also, again, try to pose some questions to you to make this interactive uh, to some point. OK. So OpenMP is really important for our group. And uh, Aachen University. I uh, joined the Architecture Review Board, that's a group that owns the standard, in um, 2006 and we're also active in the OpenMP Language Committee, that's a group uh, driving the development of OpenMP since, I think, uh, officially 2002, but even inofficially, uh, uh, inofficially even some years uh, earlier. And um, OpenMP, I think I said it on Monday, is a standard for shared memory parallel programming. So what we focus on today is really the single compute node. And we will uh, f not look at accelerators today, we will look at uh, accelerators which can also be programmed with OpenMP tomorrow. So today our goal is really to exploit all the different cores that we have in a machine. OpenMP is available for C, C++ uh, and Fortran. And um, uh, there was some uh, the initial version was created when all the vendors sat together and said we need some common set of pragmas and directives and APIs so that uh, our users can write portable parallel code. And that was when versions 1 and 2 uh, were created. And then there was some pause in the development of OpenMP. In 2008 it, it gained momentum again uh, with the release of OpenMP 3.0. And that introduced tasks, which in this introduction are also in, uh, covered in detail because we think tasks are important for, well, imp are important uh, for a significant class of algorithms, namely whenever you have to deal with something unstructured and you want to exploit parallelism here. So this is why in our introduction and some others as well, but not all, tasks are introduced uh, very first hand. And finally, in July of last year, OpenMP 4.0 was released. There are some uh, smaller, nice additions in there, like the vectorization construct that uh, Dirk will cover tomorrow. Uh, but the most prominent new feature was really the support for accelerators by means of the target uh, construct. And the goal of OpenMP 4 really is, that's my personal opinion, to take the big standard that we have to exp express parallelism and with this target construct allow this um, a set of features to be expressed or to be applied also uh, to accelerators. So everything you will learn today can also be applied 
on the accelerator program for the Interaxion Phi that we will discuss uh, tomorrow. So that is the background for OpenMP. That's my agenda for this talk. I will start with the most fundamental concept, which is a parallel region. And the parallel region is basically a set of threads or a team of threads that you need in order to distribute the work to and get some speed up. That OpenMP consists of some work sharing constructs. In this introduction, I will cover the four and the single uh, construct. And as I just uh, mentioned, afterwards, I'm going to discuss the task construct. And these are the most important constructs to express a parallelism in your code. Either regular one with these work sharing constructs or what I call irregular uh, parallelism with a task uh, construct. And then we have to also deal with some more or less ugly features. So up until here, my examples are all very nice and uh, simple. And when it comes to the scoping, this is what you have to understand and apply when you uh, work with real or larger uh, codes. You have to manage the data environment, what is shared and what is private. In many well-written kernels, uh, this can be done intuitively. You don't have to specify many things, but sometimes this is where it gets ugly. Afterwards, we will look at synchronization, which you also need in real programs. And then I, uh, if there's time left, I will run to one e through one example. Otherwise, we can do that uh, during the lab time. That was too quick. Good. So yes. I want to parallelize it. I, I mean, that's what I expect. <coughs> that's the OpenMP execution model. And uh, OpenMP is um, uh, very nice in that it allows to add in parallelism incrementally to your program. So as indicated here on the right-hand side of the slide, the OpenMP parallel program still starts with a master thread. That master thread can immediately start a parallel region, or it can do it later on. And there, the program is not limited to just one parallel region. Uh, it can consist of multiple parallel regions and possibly with a different number of threads. And in this parallel region, a team of threads, which we call the worker threads, uh, is created. So the master plus a worker thread forms a team of threads. And uh, with these work sharing and tasking construct, you can distribute work among this team of threads. And the parallel region has a well-defined beginning and a well-defined end. And in between, the threads are managed by the runtime. And you, as a programmer, you can assume they are put to sleep. There's some criticism on OpenMP that this fork join, this is how the model can be uh, named, that this is inefficient because at the end of a parallel region, uh, well, you have to get rid of the threads. But there's a lot of work being invested in, in OpenMP runtimes, so they only put the threads to sleep, and at the next parallel region, they are readily or they are already available for fast pickup. You can measure the overhead of that, we can discuss it if you're interested in the afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, but uh, even though there's an end of the parallel region, does that doesn't necessarily mean that there are any inefficiencies. Instead, it really helps you as a programmer to look at your hotspots in the code where most of the time spent, approach them first, and of course, in the end of the day, your goal should be to have as much parallelism as possible in order to get speed up. But you can start uh, with something without rewriting your whole um, program. Okay. <coughs> and that's the basic machine model. That's an uh, old picture, uh, not necessarily representing a recent architecture. So you can assume we have a set of cores, a set of processors, whatever. So some hardware execution engines that are capable of running OpenMP threads. And the mental model for HPC application is that there's roughly one OpenMP thread uh, per processor. And sometimes, if you, for example, have hyper-threading or so, there's uh, what two threads per core or only one thread per core. That depends on the application. The important thing is the shared memory uh, on the top of the figure. So all the threads have a common view of the shared memory. This common view might not be consistent throughout the computation. So threads can have intermediate results. We will come to that uh, later on. But at the end of a parallel region, at the end of work sharing construct, and after every synchronization construct, all the threads have a common view of the shared memory again. And that's the fundamental difference of this MPI programming style that we covered yesterday. We are bound to a single box with a shared memory. 
We have this cache coherence, which I talked about on Monday when I covered uh, parallel computing architectures. And we are using multiple threads that all belong to the same uh, program, meaning the same uh, process. And this is how we express parallelism in OpenMP uh, with threads. For some applications, that's a, a better model. So if really dividing your computational domain into many parts is a complex task, then you will find of often find MPI to be uh, harder to apply uh, because uh, then you have to, diff to communicate all at all the boundaries of your, of your computational domain, while in OpenMP you can just leave your model intact and distribute the work. There are downsides, so if you do it in a simple or straightforward way on current architectures, you will often run into performance problems that will be covered after the lunch break. Um, but for several applications, we found this to be the better uh, model. However, that's not to, mean to be meant or not meant to say that MPI is worse, but sometimes this is um, a more flexible and more intuitive uh, approach. Many important applications at our university are, so using, are using a so-called hybrid model, and there's one exercise in our exercise sheet uh, for you to try that out where we're using MPI on what we would call a higher level of parallelization, like you have your computational domain, your model, you cut it into many pieces and distribute these pieces over multiple nodes, and you parallelize this with MPI, and then, for example, a, a solver that's uh, solving a linear equation system that can be derived from that uh, node local model that can be parallelized in OpenMP, and if you do this hybrid approach, you can, uh, in many cases, exploit current cluster architectures pretty efficiently. Okay, so the, the, yeah, the pros of OpenMP might be it's incremental when you add it to a program. You don't have to rewrite your program from scratch like you have to do with MPI in many cases. Uh, sometimes it's simpler to sync in shared, me shared memory, but of course the, the downside is you're bound to a single box. There's no efficient way to exploit OpenMP on a cluster. We have large boxes as we introduced them on Monday, but at the end of the day you're bound still to a shingle, single shared memory. Good. So OpenMP is a pragma-based, uh, uh, follows a pragma-based approach. That means you as a programmer, you insert directives in your code to express a parallelism and to ex some extent also guide the execution of the parallel program. And the compiler is responsible for translating your code into a program that can be executed in parallel with the help of some OpenMP runtime library. And Pragma are in C, C++ uh, instructions for the compiler. Fortran, this is done with um, comments. And the fundamental uh, building block in OpenMP for parallelism is a parallel region, as I just mentioned. And uh, this slide shows uh, of, uh, how a parallel region can be uh, added to your code. A parallel region always consists of a structured block. That means it is in C and C++ uh, bounded by these curly braces, so it has a well-defined begin and a well-defined end, and there are some requirements uh, listed here, like branching in or out is not allowed. If you do it, you might be lucky, but then the OpenMP program is not standard conform. That means the result is undefined. So parallel region consists of a structured block, and what you see here is I do not express a degree of parallelism, meaning I do not express how many threads uh, I want to have in my program. And that should always be your goal. Do not define or write your parallel algorithm in a way that you assume a given number uh, of threads. That might work well for a two-core or four-core desktop, but two years later you're working on a workstation with, I don't know, 16 cores and a single processor, so you have to rewrite your code and then there are these new architectures, like for example the Intel Mic, which has 60 or 61 cores, each of which running four threads per core, so you have to deal with over 240 threads. Uh, so always try to express your parallelism in the most flexible way with, with no uh, given number of threads in mind. In OpenMP, you can specify the number of threads to be used at runtime. So there's an environment variable which you which is named OMP underscore num underscore threads, and if you set it to four thread, uh, to four, you ask the runtime to execute your program with four threads, for example. There are also other ways, like this num thread uh, clause, and there's an API construct that will be covered later. They are all equivalent, and there's 
There are some precedence rules uh, that uh, are on the reference card that we will distribute also in the lab time. And uh, I try to be interactive, so I have some demo of the simple code here. I hope you can read it in the back as well. Oh, come on. So this is my very simple OpenMP parallel hello world. So it's a C code. I'm a C, or actually C++ programmer, but I hope 400 people uh, can understand it sufficiently well. All the exercises are also available in Fortran. So that's my main routine, and I have this parallel region with these two curly braces. And here I'm saying, hello world, and I am thread. And there's an API routine named OMP get thread num that returns an identifier of a thread. And that says off, and OMP get num thread that returns the number of threads in the parallel region. The identifiers are uh, defined as follows. So the master thread, meaning the one that exists right from the program begin and also before the first parallel region as the thread ID 0 and then there are the IDs 1, 2 until n minus 1 if n is the number of threads uh, in the team. <laughs> That's my program. <coughs> I can compile it. I'm using the entry compiler here. I say dash open MP in order to enable open MP compilation in the compiler. I didn't say that OpenMP is available in almost all compilers. So we recommend the Intel compiler on our Intel architectures because for most code it gives the best performance. However, for many, many codes, GNU is equally well. Sometimes it works better with some debuggers. Sometimes Intel works better. There are also compilers like the one from Oracle, also available on Linux and also Solaris. There's a compiler from PGI on Windows, there's Microsoft, although they don't support the latest and greatest features of OpenMP. And if you go to an IBM architecture, the IBM compiler supports OpenMP. If you go to a Cray, the Cray compiler supports OpenMP, uh, and so on. I didn't mean to forget any vendor here, but uh, I think the message should be clear. OpenMP is available on almost all important compilers today. It even goes up to the embedded area. For example, Texas Instruments is offering ARM-based DSP accelerated devices uh, which can be programmed with OpenMP, including the accelerator model. Good. Hello.exe. So I'm saying ICC dash OpenMP hello world dot CPP slash oh hello exe. And now I'm saying I execute this with one thread. And it says hello world, I'm thread zero or one. And now it's here comes my first question to you. If I execute it with four threads, what will I see? Anything special or just hello and one, uh, zero of one, two of one? Yes? Okay, we cannot predict the order in which uh, the output is printed. Good. Will the output be intact, intact like, like this or will everything be uh, I don't know, garbled, Ma mix up. Sorry? Number of four, what do you mean? Yes? Yes, okay, so we will get zero of one, one of, uh, zero of four, uh, one of four, two of four, and so on. Even the strings will break up. Okay, le let's do an experiment. So what do we see here? We see hello world, hello world, hello world, some empty lines, which is a uh, backslash n, uh, it says I'm thread, I'm thread, another hello world, three of I'm thread, one of, two of, four, and so on. So it's to some extent really mixed up. And the important, there are two important uh, things to take away here. The first one is uh, the order in which the threads are created might be defined. So the OpenMP runtime creates a set of thread and numbers at zero, so zero is present, it numbers at one, two, and three. However, it's really up to the operating system in which order the threads are scheduled. And the operating system has no clue about any OpenMP thread numbering. So you cannot assume the threads to be executed in any given order. It's really parallel, and this is what we are caring about. And the other thing is that the output is also mixed up. Oh, sorry. So I wanted to look at the code again. So what do we see here? We see that these tokens, like hello world, I am thread, the off 
and the numbers. So they are not, not necessarily tokens, but let me call them tokens for a moment. That these stayed intact. And this really depends on the implementation of SCDC out. I didn't look into implementation on the current Linux, to be honest. I looked at it a few years ago. And there the technique was that they used a lock. So whenever multiple, s so when, when you do deal with I.O. devices and you want to have a thread safe implementation, uh, like G, uh, glibc or whatever uh, offers, there's some locking involved at some point. So whenever something like this token is printed into some internal buffer, which then will be pushed out to the file, to the screen, whatever, there's a lock. So that means in between here, uh, like the in between the different tokens, uh, there's no mix up, the tokens will stay correct. However, we see that different threads, are li no, depending on the thread scheduling, uh, the tokens do not get into the buffer uh, in the well-defined order. And that means when you're using third-party libraries from within your parallel code, you have to understand what's going on. If I want this to be printed correctly, meaning like it's defined here and in the right order, I can do so with the synchronization construct that we will uh, talk about later on. But if I do that consecutively, I don't express any parallelism. So that's the that's trade-off you have sometimes to do. And uh, so when you do I.O. from threads and when you do third-party libraries, libraries uh, be careful. You have to understand what's going on. Any questions on this first example? Okay. Oh, I go to a second example uh, immediately. Sorry. No. Good. I want to talk about this. What I sometimes, or what what we in OpenMP refer to as orphaning. So OpenMP introduced a feature that was not present in all the proprietary threading models that uh, were before OpenMP. And this orphaning means that um, I can, um, well, detach the point at which I create the parallelism from the point at which I exploit the parallelism. And that's a very simple example here. So I have a parallel region here that creates a team of thread. And this team of threads all execute the body of the parallel region. Every thread will call the orphaned print function. The orphaned print is what I just did. So here it says, hello world, I'm thread, and it calls the OpenMP API. And you can uh, assume that in this orphaned print or in this orphaned function, whatever, uh, you can also use all the other constructs that I'm going to talk about today. And you can also separate this over multiple uh, files. They don't necessarily have to be compiled in a single step. So this orphaning feature really allows you to, to detach the parallel region from all the uh, other functionality that you need in order to express a parallelism uh, throughout your code. Okay, but however my examples, most of them are meant to fit on a single slide or here on a single screen, and this is why you uh, will find them to be short. Uh, but of course you can also parallelize real long codes with OpenMP. Good, so that's just for your reference. Uh, this uh, explains how to uh, set the number of threads, and that's what I just did uh, in my shell. Yes, a question. Okay, the question is, does the orphaning affect the tokening? The answer is no. So it's the same, same rule. Yes. For construct. So what we did so far was pretty boring. So we just repeated the execution of the body of the parallel region by multiple threads. It's not how we distribute the work. And um, in many programs, loops account for most of the program's runtime. For example, if you solve a linear equation system, uh, in most implementations I'm aware of, this is expressed by loops, for example, over the rows of the metrics uh, or something similar. So this is what I mean with loops account for most of the program's runtime. And in order to exploit that, uh, in OpenMP, we have the for work sharing construct. So this is shown here. We say pragma OMP parallel to create a team of threads. And then we add the for, which means the parallel for has to be followed by this for construct, which uh, performs some iterations, which, we should, which should be distributed among the team of threads. So what I'm doing here in the simple example is 
I'm adding vectors B and C element-wise and storing the result in A. I do that for a small, tiny vector, but uh, in order to get a real speed up, uh, you should address larger uh, loops or you do should do uh, computationally more expensive operations in here. But it suffices, I think, for an uh, example. So what the for does or and the compiler and the runtime do for you when you specify the for work chain construct. At runtime, the loop iterations are distributed among the threads in the team. If there's one thread, this thread will execute all the iterations. If there are four, some chunking will be applied in order uh, for all threads to get more or less the same amount of loop iterations. There are some options so that you can influence the distribution uh, of, of the iterations to the threads, but we will discuss it uh, in the afternoon. And that's um, visualization here. So uh, these are my three vectors, A, B, and C. And uh, that's kind of the pseudo code. So assuming I have four threads, what the runtime will do is the first thread will work on iteration 0 to 24, including 24, the second from 25 to 49, and so on. And they will all, uh, following this rule, work on independent partitions of the vectors A, B, and C. S for example, this, vec this thread number 3, iterating from 50 to 74, will iterate uh, on, on these chunks or will read these chunks of C and B and write to the third chunk uh, of A. And this is shared memory parallelism, so every thread can in principle access all the data in the shared memory. But of course we have to, well, work on a way so that threads do not access data uh, from other threads or that other threads will write to, then we would have a data race that we will discuss uh, when we talk about synchronization. But here we are distributing the iterations among the team of threads, which are obviously uh, all independent from each other. Good, let's look at the demo again. I have to end this and go here. Vector addition. So that's, that's my uh, simple code example here. I have, oh, I have a large vector, reasonably large. I, I have a parallel region that initializes the vectors A, B, and C with 0, 1, and 2. And I have a second parallel region. Why we need that, you will uh, learn in the afternoon. And then we have a second uh, parallel region, uh, which is here now in the middle of the slide. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the four work chain, uh, the four loop iterating from zero to the dimensions of the vector, performing the operation which I just described. And here you also see the effect of orphaning. The parallel region is above. It will create a team of threads which will all execute the body of the parallel region. Here's a single. I will talk to about that in a few minutes. And the four is detached from the parallel region. So this four work chain construct will distribute the iterations of the loop directly encountered after the four over the threads in the team that has been spawned uh, before. Okay. So I will again uh, compile this. And I think I added what? Okay, I added some uh, time measurement uh, facilities to this code so that I can see whether I get the speed up with uh, from one to two threads. And I hope I will be successful on this uh, machine here. It's an interactive machine; it might be overloaded. So the computation started with one thread. It took 2.8 seconds. Let me see what happens with two threads whether we do get a speed up here, 1.55 seconds. Okay, there's a speed up, it's not a factor of two, but reasonably close. What would you have expected? Like this? Okay, why not, why not exactly two? Overhead. Bit of overhead, okay. What kind of overhead? Creating the threads, okay, yeah. Creating threads is some overhead, but it shouldn't account for that. Any other idea? Who was here on Monday? 
some sequential code. I think I don't measure the time in the sequential code. So I think this is only the parallel code that I measure here. So Monday I talked about NUMA architectures and caches and things like that. And I just threw my threads on a busy machine and uh, Root will cover that in detail later on. So for this simple operation with this size of vector we can get a linear speed up by doing thread binding. And uh, if you like we can do that interactively in the lab session later on. But that's okay, so we just wrote something like pragma on p parallel 4 in front of a loop and we get a speed up of 2. If we would have used 4 cores, we might uh, get a speed up of 3.5 and so on. So for a simple start, that's nice. And uh, for, I, I mean, we had many success stories with uh, simple codes like this. So we worked on the code a few weeks uh, on a 16 core machine. We get a speed up of 8, which means the runtime of a week is shrunken to a runtime of 1. Uh, if then the user is happy, uh, he doesn't have to do any more work. If you, of course, have a demanding compute load, uh, in order to, to get your results, you might be interested or motivated in putting in more work, more effort. You will learn about that today. Uh, you can always tweak your code further, add more tuning. Uh, it's really your choice to understand when to stop and go into production. It depends on your uh, needs. So we can do better. We will learn about how to do better. But I think it's nice for a start. Any questions on that? Okay, so I just threw two threads on an interactive machine where several people are logged in. It gave us some speed up, but um, yeah, if I want to control every, if I'm going to control everything and understand more things, I will get a linear speed up. That's my conclusion. The single construct we already had uh, in my example here. Uh, so now that we can create a team of threads with a parallel region, we can distribute loop iterations among the threads of the team. We need something to do I.O. from within a parallel region as an example for the single. So single is also defined as a work sharing construct, but it works in a way uh, that it's executed only once by one of the threads in the team. It's not defined which thread will execute it. In most cases, it's a thread that, uh, that encounters the single first, but it's not necessarily, necessarily this thread. So the single construct encountered by multiple threads will be executed by one thread in the team, or the other threads will jump around, and there's a synchronization construct, which uh, we call an implicit barrier that will be explained later on, at which all this the other threads wait, meaning at the end of the single, until the thread that uh, executed the body of the single construct finishes this execution. So that's a single, one thread enters, all the others jump around but wait, and after the single, or when threads continue after the single, it's guaranteed that the single construct has been uh, completely executed. An example for that is I.O. You can do memory allocation in a parallel region, so for example a malloc of a large structure should be executed by only one thread, and then multiple threads work in parallel on this last large uh, uh, structure. And we will also need it uh, in many cases uh, for tasking. What we looked at was the work sharing construct. The for work sharing is pretty regular uh, parallelism. So for the four loops I had here, it was always clear how many iterations will be executed. And that's a requirement for the for work sharing construct. The, the compiler has to be able to compute the number of iterations at compile R. No. The compiler has to be able to generate code so that the runtime knows when this construct is encountered how many um, uh, iterations will be executed. There was a very simple form of the work sharing of, the, of this for loop. For example, with C++ random ex access iterators, you can do the same and also OpenMP, and OpenMP also allows a random access iterator loops uh, to be parallelized with this for work sharing construct. But in all cases, the number of iterations has to be known. If you, for example, have a task, uh, if, if you, for example, have a recursive algorithm like Fibonacci, or you're searching in a graph and you're going deeper and deeper in the structure until you find the element or whatever, you ne don't necessarily know how many operations you have to perform. And uh, specifically, there's no static or no, no well-structured for loop. If you have a while loop, for instance, while uh, a certain condition is not fulfilled, do some more work, like you re refine your uh, domain, or yeah, just as an example, do something. 
uh, also the for loop doesn't work well. So this is what I meant with unstructured or irregular algorithm, and this is what tasks can be used for. And in the past, we used uh, Fibonacci to introduce tasks, but I uh, came up with a, a way more important uh, program, clearly a Sudoku solver, uh, which I hope is a little bit more entertaining than uh, computing Fibonacci numbers. So that's a stupid Sudoku solver. You can do it much better. But again, the code is simple. It fits on a slide, or in two slides we will see in a second. And it uh, profits from task parallelism uh, without adding too much logic here. So that's my simple algorithm uh, in order. So it, it, it's brute force, and uh, I will distribute uh, the searches over multiple cores in order to speed up the computation. Uh, it first has to find an empty field, and then it inserts a number. Well, the numbers can be ranged in this example from 1 to 16. It checks the Sudoku. If invalid, it tries the next number. If, if it's valid, it keeps the number and goes to the next field. That's a standard brute force uh, Sudoku solver. So it tries all the valid combinations and it finds all valid uh, solutions to this uh, Sudoku. Who's playing Sudoku? Who has written his own solver? One. Oh, usually there are more. So like 50% of the Sudoku players have written their own solver usually. Okay. Good. So let me talk about the task construct. The task is a very lightweight thing. So a task consists of some code, which again is denoted within these curly braces in a structured block, and also possibly some data. And when the task construct is encountered in OpenMP, you can imagine something that I will explain now, which I found many people to help understanding tasks, but it's not the exact technical description. Okay, so what happens if uh, what happens if a task is encountered is that the code and the data is being packed up, packed up. So a small, I would call it work packages created of exactly this code and some data, and it's put onto a work queue. And whenever there are threads idling, waiting at a synchronization construct and things like that, the open and pre runtime will make these threads monitor the work queue and then pick up these tasks from the work queue. Okay, so you define small packages of work to be put onto a queue and then threads will pick them up, execute them, uh, and so on. Uh, technically more correct is really that when a task is encountered, it's either executed directly or the thread is, well, paused for a tiny moment and switched to a different task which is present in a work queue or um <coughs> somewhere else. And the good thing about tasks is that the task can be nested. So the four work sharing construct cannot contain another four work sharing construct unless there's a second parallel region. But tasks can create more tasks, which then can create more tasks, and they can also be uh, uh, put into a work sharing construct. That's something we will see uh, later on. And as I said, there's some data, so you don't know these clauses yet, I will cover them later on. So there's some shared data, uh, which is in the shared memory. There's some private data, which means that it's data being part of the task uh, package. So a task, is a task construct is encountered, and either the task is executed directly, or technically it's deferred, meaning it's put somewhere in a queue, and then later on picked up by one of the threads in the team. You always need a team of threads, because these are executing the tasks. If you don't have a team, you don't have any parallelism. And it's not defined which thread will, going will go to pick up the task in the queue. So you're really expressing, try to think of tasks in a way that you're expressing all the independent work packages in your algorithm or in your work, and the runtime is responsible for coming up with a mapping of these work packages to the threads. And some runtimes are doing a good job, some others are not doing such a good job. Uh, but in general, I, I think the OpenMP tasking is successful. This is how parallel Sudoku can be implemented with tasks. So I need a Pragma OMP parallel, meaning I need a team of threads uh, to distribute my tasks on. And then this parallel is encountered immediately, or is, is enclosed, no. The whole parallel region just consists here of a single construct. 
So single means one thread executes it, all the others jump around. And this is because I want to start my algorithm, like search an empty field, with just one thread. I have to start somewhere. I don't have anything parallel to do here. There's no parallelism that I exploit. I have to start with the first field, and from there, as I will discuss in a second, we can go parallel. So I have this parallel with a single. How can I get, assuming that I will create tasks, any parallelism from that? So these threads that jump around the single are waiting at this con synchronization construct. And as soon as tasks appear in this work queue, the runtime is free, that these threads go on and pick up the, the task from this work queue. And this is how I will get a speed up uh, from my code. Okay, so this is still done by this uh, thread executing a single search an empty field. It will find this one, insert a number, check the Sudoku, and uh, this is now my parallelism. <coughs> if it's invalid, so I will start always with a number one to be added. If it's invalid, I can create a range of tasks trying all the other numbers. I said this is a, a brute force mechanism. It's not a clever approach, but it will find all the possible, uh, all the valid solutions. <laughs> <coughs> so this, if invalid, well, actually not, sorry. So this is, this is mixed up. Not the if invalid, but the delete number and insert the next number, that's a task. So that means I create a copy of the board as it is at the moment and put it into a task with the next uh, number to try. And at the end, I have to wait. There's a task wait. I'm waiting for all the child tasks. And I will explain the details of the task wait later on. Does this make sense? So uh, for every field, I'm trying to check uh, the number, uh, all the valid numbers from 1 to 16. And uh, if the one I tr start with, like the one, or it, which is one, is not correct, I'm creating tasks to try all the others. And I have to create a copy of the board, and then for every other task, I have to continue uh, uh, with the same. So it's a recursive algorithm. Okay, you're happy with that? Yes, one question. Mm, okay, the question was, is there a reason, a reason why I start the parallel with a single and then start the first work and not do this initial work and then start the parallel region? Yes, we will see it in the code. So this allows me to have an uh, unmodified recursive algorithm. So this is needed for the recursion. So in general, it can be assumed that I'm in a parallel region. I don't have a special case here for the first call. Okay. Good. So this is now actual code. If you're interested, I can make the code available in the lab exercise, and you can play with it. So this has pragma OMP parallel, and this is the OMP single, and there's already the end of the parallel region. And this just calls my solve parallel, and that's my Sudoku board. Actually, I don't know what the other parameters are for. I think these are just some tests. Uh, so ignore the other parameters. What I need is the parallel region with a single, and it just starts the solving process. And um, uh, this is a Sudoku board. OK, I think I explained that. And um, yeah, if, I don't, if you don't want the single, you can write something like pragma OMP parallel sections. We will explain later on why this works. But this will basically create uh, make it equivalent so that only one thread executes the solve uh, parallel. That's syntactic sugar. Uh, yeah, maybe later on. Okay, and that's my most of the implementation of this parallel single. So here I'm checking all the numbers, and uh, if the check fails, um, I need a new copy of the Sudoku board. I'm calling this uh, constructor here, it's a C++ code, and I'm uh, taking a copy of the current board with me in a first private, and that will make a copy of the Sudoku board uh, pointer available in the task. And I set the number at the current position, here's the number at the current position, and then call the solve parallel again. That's the OMP task, and right at the end of the routine, I'm waiting. So this is a recursive algorithm. So solve parallel, call solve parallel again, and so on. So we're creating a tree here. Uh, it's not a balanced tree, and that will be some of the performance problems that we will see later on. But we're creating a tree when we execute this um, 
recursive algorithm and every recursive call uh, is basically, every recursive call here uh, will basically create a new task. And here, this is a special, or th that's not a synchronization uh, for all the threads, the task wait, it only waits for part in the tree. I will explain that later on. Does this principle make sense? Okay, some people not. And that's the poor performance I get. So that's the runtime in second on the two socal Sandy Bridge. So with one thread, a little bit over eight seconds. And then with, I think, 32 threads, I get the best performance with, I don't know, 0.8 uh, seconds roughly, which is a speed up of 10. Is that good or is that bad? Yes. Why the bump at 12? Why the bump at 12? Um, OK, so someone asked me that previously, and I looked it up. I'm I don't have the explanation in my head at the moment. Why the bump at 12? So the last time I answered, the tree is not well structured. So there's there are slight variations whenever you execute it with parallel regions, because this 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 uh, search tree is not is not balanced. Okay, and uh, sometimes the mapping of these tasks to the threads works better, and sometimes it, it doesn't work as well. But I'm not sure whether this was the explanation uh, for that. We can investigate in the lab. So that that was my answer last time. I'm not sure whether it was a correct one or not. Okay, so my question is speed up of 10, is it good, is it bad? How, how can we know? If you're happy with it, yeah, well, that's a fine answer. If you're happy with it, go for it, compute, okay. So actually, it's a tough question. So you really have to understand what's going on in order to be happy. And that's a motivation for the talk on OpenMP tools that I think Dirk will do uh, this afternoon. So with the tools, we will take a look at what's going on. And we will learn, it's OK, but we can do better. OK? Uh, however, I think that that's already, that, that numbers uh, with a speed of 10 is already using some optimization. So we will take a look at a simpler version and um, uh, then learn how to make the code even better. Okay, so if so, that, that try to be my lesson here uh, for you. If you have some parallelism, if you're happy with it, go for it. If you, but but the question is the code really running good is very hard. So over the year we have some advanced courses, in which we teach you to do some performance modeling things like that that will help you to understand uh, how much performance should you get and am I close to this or not. But it's really a tough question, and, and tools can help you to understand what's going on and whether there's room for improvement and uh, possibly at which cost. So performance tuning is never for free, okay? We will learn how to do better later on. Good. <coughs> I think I'm doing fine on time. Uh, so, so far, uh, there were a few remarks on the shared and private clauses, but everything worked more or less uh, magically, except for in the Sudoku, we had a long list of first private variables. And uh, I said shared memory. This is what we're doing here. So most of the data should be assumed to be in this uh, shared memory. But of course, we need some variables to be uh, private, meaning threads might have uh, very their own uh, result, uh, th their own uh, values. And if we take a look at this one here, a, B, and C are certainly shared. So these arrays are in the shared memory. I don't want to have any thread private things here. But I, this loop variable, has certainly to be private because otherwise all the threads would iterate over the same area or they would always write to uh, overwrite the results of the other thread because every thread is performing an I++. And OpenMP takes care of that uh, for you. By default, if you use a for work sharing construct, the loop iteration variable, which is the I in this case, is private. So what does it mean? <coughs> private means, and there are some default rules, which I will cover now, and there's, uh, you can also put these variables in this private clause, and then the compiler in runtime will make these variables private. 
private means there's a new instance of a variable per thread, or if you put it on a task construct, there's a new instance per task. A new instance means an uninitialized instance, and that's important. So if you have a private variable like the x, and it has a value, like an x, and it has a value before the parallel region, for example, 23, and you say pragma won't be parallel private x, there will be one x for every thread, but it will be uninitialized. Some implementations or compilers might initialize it with zero, some others uh, might not, or will not, but it will not have the value 5. If you want to have it to have the value 5, there's first private. So that means it's a private variable, but initiali it's initialized with a, master with a value of the master thread. Or if you put it in front, or uh, if you put it to a task construct, it will be initialized with the value at uh, the variable head at the time the task is created. And then for four loops, uh, four work sharing construct, there's last private, and that means the value of uh, any private variable, uh, the value it has in the last loop iteration is written back to the master. So the ma value can persist after the parallel region. That's also important to understand after a parallel region, all private variables after the parallel region are gone. All the values in a private region, a private variable, are gone. If you need them, you have to either use something like last private or you have to copy uh, it back. Shared variables are available for all the threads. If you write to them, uh, write to the same location in an array, for example, without proper synchronization, you will end up with a data race. And there are some special rules in OpenMP, which I really do not like, but um, uh, they are present. So I said loop control variables on four constructs or do constructs in Fortran, respectively, are private. Uh, all variables are, and, and static variables are by default shared. And uh, non-static variables local in the parallel region are private, and these are th has technical regions. So let's look at static variables first. So a static variable is something which is really a different variable. So it has a fixed address, and it will be present at the before actually main is entered. Um, and um, static variables can also be made accessible from different compilation units. So static variables cannot be made private in a private list. If you want them to be private, I will explain uh, how to do that, I think, on the next slide. All non-static variables, meaning all standard variables, that are declared within a parallel region are private. And you can imagine the following. If the master thread encounters a variable declaration outside of the parallel region, this variable by default will be shared. Then there's a parallel region, and all the threads execute the parallel region. And if then a thread encounters a variable declaration, every thread will encounter the variable declaration. And hence, it will be kind of a private variable because there's one for every thread. Some more examples. Does this make sense? So that's really important. You have to manage the data environment, and this is what scoping stands for. Okay, if you want to parallelize static variables, there's a pragma op thread private. That means there's one instance of this variable for every thread. And this instance will be created at the time the thread is created. It will be destroyed at the time the thread is destroyed. And that's equivalent to things like TS TLS alloc, that's thread local storage on Win32 threads, pthread cre uh, key create, that's the equivalent in POSIX threads, and uh, GNU extension, the compiler is underscore underscore thread. But try to avoid it, really. So static variables can cause a lot of problems when it comes to parallelism. There are some old C textbooks around which tell you static variables can give you a performance improvement. Usually it does not, does not uh, with current compilers, or there are better ways to achieve that. So try to avoid static variables in um, together with parallelism, and then try to avoid uh, thread private. If you have to, uh, OMP thread private is the solution. The problem is, for example, if you have a static variable somewhere in a routine, and then you call this routine from within OpenMP, and the OpenMP parallelization is only added later on, uh, there will be this, this uh, rule that all the variables are private by default, because the threads will encounter them, except for this ugly static variable, because that's always static, for technical reasons. And, um, you will have or might have a hard time finding 
uh, the problem that there's a data race. So if you're working with older codes or with libraries and you want to call them from s uh, within parallel regions, you have to make sure that uh, there are no static variables. And um, yeah, so if the library is thread safe, it will use techniques like mentioned here in order to be thread safe. And some people like the OpenMP rule, uh, rules for the static scoping. This is why I have them here condensed on my slide. So static global variables are shared. Automatic storage location, that's a technical term in C and C++ for variables declared on a local block, like for example in a function or in a parallel region. These are private by default if, if encountered from within a parallel region. And um, for tasking, all the variables that, that are, let me try to summarize this here, all the variables that are not shared, made shared by any explicit mechanism are first private by default. Why is that? So first private means, again, there's a copy of the variable per task and it's initialized. And this is important because you don't know when the task will be executed. So when the task is created and you have something first private, it will be created for a variable will be created for the task and the value copied will be copied into the task. And then the task might be put onto a work queue and only later on when it's executed, uh, well, it needs a variable. And if it would not have been first private by sh but shared, uh, the value might have been gone or modified. So if you want to capture something uh, at the time the task is created, you have to use first private. And this is uh, why first private is a default for tasks, uh, unless things are explicitly uh, made shared. And um, yeah, this is now an example. So this code doesn't do anything meaningful. It's just there to be a very complicated example uh, of data scoping. But I, I, I tried or I try to catch all the ugly uh, corner uh, cases. So I have variable, uh, I have several variable declarations here throughout the code. I have several OpenMP constructs, and I want to take a look at inside this task what the what is the scope of these different variables. Is it private? Is it shared? And so on. And let me look at A first. So that's a C example. A is declared outside the scope of a function. So that means it's a global variable. That means it's a sh static uh, variable, and that means it is. Shared, right. So it means there's only one A. One A for all the threads and all the tasks. Whenever they say A, this is, this is the A here. So A is shared. How can I make A private? With this ugly thread private. So here, right behind the declaration, I have to say pragma OMP thread private A. That's my only option. Good, so B and C are declared within a function. So this is automatic storage location in C and C++ language. But it's they are declared outside of the parallel region. And here we have two parallel regions. So the first one creates a team of threads. And the second one, this will be encountered by every thread of the outer parallel region, will create another team of threads. So we have a thread tree here. Okay, Two parallel regions nested inside each other. If, om if the number of threads is defined to be four, the first parallel region will create four threads, and then every thread crea will create another four threads. We have 16 threads here. And every thread will create a task. Okay? So, assuming ah, here B is declared shared, or scoped shared, that would be the default because it's declared before the parallel region. So it means there's one B for every thread in this parallel region. But here we make B private. So that means there will be one B for every inner thread created by this parallel region. So one B for the outer team and one B, uh, a private B then for every inner thread. And then there's a task. And any idea what the scope of B will be, in the be inside the task? Why is it first private? Everything, so that, that's my, m that was my, try, I tried to condense a rule. Everything that's not shared before a task is first private. So it means every task, and every inner thread will create one ta exactly one task in this example, will create another copy of B and will capture the value of B. But B is a private variable in this parallel region, so it's not initialized. So as I said, uh, 
It doesn't make sense it's just for the discussion of all the different corner cases. What about C? So we do, uh, we're not saying anything here for C and this is uh, this makes C shared at the parallel region. Okay, C s one C here and one C here, so C is sh still shared. That means it's implicitly made shared and hence it's shared within the task. So you can imagine there's some, some property or some, uh, uh, I'm missing the English word, uh, inheritance. So there's some inheritance of the sharing property and this is why C is shared. There's only one C for all the threads and all the tasks in the program. Okay. What about D? D is declared inside the parallel region. So for, for every thread created in this parallel region there will be one D. So that means it's kind of private and that means there's no inheritance of shared. So it will be first private within the task. And finally E, which the variable declared inside the task, what will be the scope? First private, not close to, it's private because it's declared here inside the task. So there's no copy of the value, but it's equivalent, so it's the same number of variables. And private again means one instance per thread or per task, uh, and shared means only one instance at all. That's the difference, okay? If you want to copy variables, clone them, you have to make them shared or uh, private or first private. If you only want to have one and work independently on, on it, you have to make it shared. There's a default none. Oh, my animation doesn't work. So what you can say here at the parallel region is pragma on parallel default none. So it's a clause that you can add. And that then the compiler will force you for every variable to be used to explicitly say whether it's shared, private, or first private. And that's a good recommendation because um, it will force you to think about every single variable. And you will have to reason, should it be shared, should it be private, do I want to have one or one per thread and task? And uh, it, it not only helps you to avoid errors, it also help, helps others to better understand the code. Okay, that's my recommendation. Luckily, most codes are not as complicated as this one. So you will see in the example that for many kernels, solvers, whatever, you're, only, uh, you're, you're pretty good with the defaults. Good. So, and now that we know that we what shared variables are, we have to understand how to, uh, well, guard them from concurrent accesses. And um, that actually came from an example I created many years for in the one of the first OpenMP lectures. So I explained the four work sharing construct to the attendees and what they did is they looked at all the work sharing, all the four loops they had in their code and uh, put the pragma OP parallel four uh, in front of them. And of course results were not correct. So we technically, it's your responsibility. If you say pragma on be parallel four, the compiler will generate a parallel loop. But if you, if you do it and the loop iterations are not independent, you will have a data race. And the data race, uh, uh, an informal definition is if at in between two synchronization constructs, multiple threads, at least two, access uh, the same memory location and at least one of them modifies this memory location, then the result is undefined or it's not deterministic. So times sometimes this one thread, this thread is the first one um, will update and the other is the second one and sometimes it's uh, the other way around because the operating system scheduling has no idea uh, what you're trying to do. And then the result is not deterministic. For some codes this might be fine, for most codes that's an error. Okay, so wha what's the problem here in my code? Yes. Ah, I haven't declared S. Well, let's. <laughs> okay, let, let me fix that. Let me fix that problem. Okay, so now I have I, S, and an array A with some in initialization. No, not not one thousand one hundred. Okay, is it better? I still have a problem in my code. 
Yes. It's a serial code. No, it's parallel. Okay. Yeah, you're meaning the right. Uh, you, you're meaning the right thing, but when you say it's a serial code, that that's not correct. So the compiler will generate threads. It will distribute the iterations over the team of threads. And as you said, in my computation, I need the result from the previous iteration, which is a kind of a serialization. But the compiler in runtime will not do that for you. The compiler cannot understand what's going on. In this example, it could, but it will not. So you have to make sure that this is correct. So what could we do in order to get the right result? <coughs> what we could do is guard this one here, s equals s plus a of i. Um, we have a con synchronization construct here, uh, which is the OMP critical, which can optionally get a name. So for all the criticals within an OpenMP program with the same name, only one thread is allowed to be uh, in that critical uh, at a given time. So it's an implementation of mutual exclusion. So there's only one critical. If multiple threads arrive, one thread will enter. The others have to wait. Only when the first thread has exited the critical, the next one is allowed to enter. And if you have multiple criticals with the same name, uh, the, the, the statement applies for both. So it's uh, regarded as one single critical region. Okay, so that implements mutual exclusion. So what I could do here is I guard this access. So only one thread at a time is allowed to modify S. Is this correct? First answer. Yes, it's correct. Is this good? <laughs> no, why not? Right, multiple right answers. So it's effect effectively serialized. So what happens here? I'm creating a team of threads. Yoo hoo four threads. Every thread will en enter it here. Four threads will arrive at the critical. Damn it, only one can enter. And uh, so one thread enters, the others wait. And the one entered is done, goes to the next iteration. Meanwhile, a second one enters. But uh, effectively, at every single point in time, only one thread can be active. If you run that, on a machine, all the cores will be busy. Power consumption will go, go up. And for example, Windows Task Manager will say 100% busy in the system, and so on. But speed up will be below one, so it will be actually a slow uh, down. Because the only thing what we're doing to this code is adding overhead of thread creation and uh, getting access to log variable, which is the underlying implementation uh, of a critical. So that's obviously a correct solution, but a not a good solution. So now it's your turn. Oh, let me get rid of this thing here. I'm trying to make this code correct and scalable. And you can do that with all the measures we have uh, learned today already. And well. Sorry, still some declarations are missing. S is an integer, A is an integer array, simple things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good explanation. So I repeat it for the video recording. You would privatize S, initialize it with zero, then do this work sharing, like uh, uh, create the chunks, work on the S, and later on we need a way to summarize it. In order, with the current techniques we have at the moment, in order to summarize it, I would uh, create a new variable, which I, which I name PS. I will explain in a second, so that, that should be... Okay, so I think the color is uh, don doesn't contribute. So I will make a PS. No, uh, it's an integer. And uh, PS stands for private S, because this is uh, the best option in order to go uh, to summarize to the global result. So 
A requirement that I didn't explain is that after the parallel region, the result should be an S as well. If I make S private, the S after the parallel region cannot uh, hold the, the, the whole value. Okay, so I have a new variable here, PS, and that's what I'm doing my computation with. And how can I now sum up the, I would also call it partial results of the different thread to the global S? User critical, okay. Right answer. So I need something like... Uh, the control key is on a different key than on, on the laptop I usually use, so that's really confusing here. And I'm doing S plus equals PS. Critical. Let me fit it onto a slide so that you can see it. So let me check. So we have a private variable which we call PS. It's initialized with zero. We do the computation on the PS and we create a partial. We have a partial sum here at the end of the four. Every thread has a partial sum in PS. And here we have the pragma P critical and S should be the final result and we're adding the partial sums for each thread. So that's correct. We have the final result. Why does this scale? Why is this a good solution? We still have a critical. Isn't that a problem? Right. Okay. So the critical is, is, is tiny. So that's basically one floating point operation. Possibly with an assignment. And uh, usually, well, in order to be efficient, that the vector should be longer. Okay. But this is a computationally intensive part. So that could be, I don't know, the setup of the stiffness matrix in your code and you create smaller uh, partial matrices and then in a critical you, you combine these partial matrices to a big one as a real example. Or this could be longer vectors with partial sum and here you're just adding uh, the numbers. <coughs> so that works uh, reasonably uh, good and uh, it's a pattern that can also be used in a real code. Let me ask you one question. I'm using pseudocode here again, okay? OMP get num threads because I've seen OMP get thread num uh, go away, go away. Control. I think you get the idea. So I do not have a private variable, but I do. Um, I do something like this, where I have a array of the dimension of the number of threads. So that 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 doesn't actually compile, I guess. But uh, assuming I have an array with the number of threads of the team. And uh, then it would be OMP. Let me get it at least open and p-technically correct. So that's the number of threads that will be used at the next parallel region. So assuming I have four threads, I have an uh, integer array p underscore s uh, with elements 0, 1, 2, and 3. And here I'm writing uh, to it with the OMP get thread num. So that means thread 1 is writing to array uh, to the position 1, thread 2 at position 2, and so on. And it here, Every thread is uh, updating S again. It's correct, but why is the performance of this really, really, really bad? Because of the computer architecture, correct? So the keyword here is fault sharing. I explained that on Monday. So this small array PS for integers. In memory, this sits on a cache line. So cache line with 64 byte in size, meaning eight doubles, 16 integers. And um, this is the smallest unit that can be transferred from memory to the processor. So that means here, thread X 
has to load the cache line from the memory uh, and modify the variable. At the same time, the other thread is also trying to modify the cache line. And whenever an update has been performed, the cache line is invalid, and the other thread has to load it. So the cache line, if you remember my great PowerPoint animation on Monday, will constantly go back and forth between the different cores. If it happens to sit in a shared cache, you will not notice. If caches are not shared, you will see a severe performance degradation. Okay, so that's just, I some people write code that way. Technically, it's correct, but it doesn't give you the right performance because it interferes with the way the hardware is working. There are a few concepts, so Root will go into fault sharing again in the afternoon. A few concepts that you have to be aware of, which will be NUMA and these caches, um, and uh, yeah, caches in general, how they work with possibly fault sharing, just uh, as a remark. Uh, very similar code, but significantly worse performance. Okay, our first solution was correct. There was one private variable, so that would be aligned uh, on the stack of each cache, meaning if you load it, you only get this one and uh, there would be no uh, performance issue. Does it make sense? Okay. Good. And uh, what I just uh, described was a simp simple thing, but a very important thing. People need it again and again. And uh, it's an error-prone technique. And uh, as I just illustrated, sometimes people do not get the performance-efficient solution. So OpenMP has a way to do that automatically, which is a reduction keyword. So reduction, uh, Christo also uh, introduced it yesterday with MPI. A reduction is operation in which some private variable will be initialized for every thread, and then the threads will operate independently on each other on this private variable, and then it will be combined with some combination operation to form a single result. So that's an informal description of a reduction operation. And in OpenMP, it has this form, you say reduction, that's the combination operation, the combiner operation. So that's usually also what you find here. So that means the global S will be summed up, uh, or will, will be summed up because we specified the sum here. And S is the actual variable that should be made private, one instance for every thread, that will be used throughout the computation, and then the runtime and compiler together will create a code that will generate the final sum, which will be present here, basically at the end of the curly brace, uh, without introducing a data race. These are the standard reduction operations uh, with the corresponding in initialization values. OpenMP4 has a way to declare user-defined reductions, so that means nowadays you can, I don't know, do a string concatenation if you like, you can uh, reduce uh, uh, fields or structs and, and whatever, you can work with your own user-defined data types, but for simple data types or build language built-in data types, this is uh, what you have uh, out of uh, the box. I think I will mention user-defined reductions later uh, in the afternoon. Okay, so the reduction just does what we did uh, previously. It also possibly allows to co uh, the compiler for some additional uh, optimizations of the corresponding uh, code, and uh, that should be the preferred way to go. Good, and um, uh, to summarize the uh, uh, synchronization uh, chapter, I uh, have to well explain a few things that I mentioned throughout uh, the discussion. The first thing is a barrier. So a barrier can either be implicit at the end of every work chain construct. I explained it for the single, but also at the end of the four work chain construct, at the end of the loop, there's an implicit barrier, and afterwards, every thread will have the same consistent view of the memory. A barrier is something that uh, can only be passed if all threads reach the exact very same barrier. So that means all the threads that come here will have to wait until the very last thread also arrives. Only then they are allowed to proceed. So that's the barrier. It has to be encountered by all the threads in the team. If one thread doesn't encounter the barrier, we'll have a deadlock because the others uh, will wait uh, for the guy uh, who, will never, uh, who, who doesn't arrive. And for tasks, there's a task wait. And it's a little bit more complicated. So a barrier also, after a barrier, it's also guaranteed that all tasks are completed. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So a barrier is also a complete task synchronization point. If you only have uh, the need to 
uh, wait for some tasks, there's a task wait. If you remember the, um, uh, the Sudoku example, I was talking about the task tree that is generated, and the task tree uh, only needs um, in between partial synchronization. And uh, I will talk about the Fibonacci example later on where we'll also discuss it. So the task wait does not wait for all the tasks, but only for the direct childs. So if a thread or a task encounters a task wait, it will only f wait for these tasks that were directly spawned or created by that, that guy encountering the task wait. All the others, deeper tasks, are not waited for. And um, this is what you need in recursive algorithms, so you only have to wait for that, that for example, in Fibonacci, two guys that you created, or in uh, the Sudoku for the variations uh, that you started. You do not have to wait for all the others. If you would put a barrier, you wouldn't get any uh, speed up uh, at all. Okay. Yes? It will implicitly wait, so the for loop is a work chain construct, and all the work chain construct have an implicit barrier at the end. There's a barrier. If you put in a second one, the compiler will optimize it away because there's already one. Except you f if you put something in between the barrier and the for loop. Okay. And just to explain it again, so I have a parallel region here, and it creates np threads. Every thread will encounter a task construct, so that means np tasks are created in total, and function A is executed np times. At the end of the barrier, all threads have arrived here, and all tasks have been uh, completed. Then there's a single, that means one thread will enter it, all the others will jump right away to the end of the single. One thread will create a task, so function B could be executed by the one creating the task or by any of the other threads waiting at the end of the single. And here at the end of the single, there's also an implicit barrier. And uh, then it's also guaranteed that all threads ha have arrived and the B task or function B has been executed. Any questions on that? Does it make sense? Roughly? Okay. I have another three minutes. Let me go through one final example. That's a computation of pi or p. Uh, that uh, can be approximated by uh, using the, this, the, the integral uh, shown here, and that's implemented here in the code. So I have 4 divided by x 1 plus x to the power of 2. I uh, use a number of intervals in order to do a very simple and straightforward numerical integration. Uh, that's my I don't know, difference between the intervals, so I'm integrated from 0 to 1. So that's 1 divided by the number of intervals is my, I don't know, step width. Searching for the English word here, I guess step width is, is not too far off. And uh, then I'm computing uh, the value here and uh, add the uh, partial result to my local uh, sum. I'm in, in the end, I do the multiplication to derive with, with pi. I guess that's a straightforward approach of numerical integration. How can I parallelize it? The dots are showing where to parallelize it, because here there's nothing to exploit, and all the computational cost that uh, arises here is, call is uh, well caused by the call of f here. So that's, that's basically my whole program. What do I need? I can edit, edit the slides, so let's do it interactively. Now we start with a pragma OMP parallel. No, it's your turn. What do we need? Do we need tasks or any work sharing? We need private variables, yes, but first, do we want to have tasks or do we want to have this work for work sharing? Four, right. So if there's a loop, you can do it with tasks, but if there's a loop which can do with a for work sharing construct, do it. So that's a simple approach. And then you said we need a private variable. Which one do we have to privatize? X, very good. So in most classes 
the x is forgotten. Actually, here it's now mentioned for the first time. So why do we need to have ma make? Uh, why do we need to make x private? So x is declared before the parallel region, means it's shared, one x. And if there's only one x, every thread will write to it and overwrite the value of the other uh, thread. So we have to make it private. We do not have to make it first private because we're not reading it here. We're just writing and then reading there. So private is fine. That's not all. Reduction. Correct. So we this is a reduction operation. Reduction. If we say plus sum. So sum again has to be made private because we are adding something to it. And either we would do this as a critical or we learned the more efficient way with a reduction. So we need one sum per thread right to it. And at the end we need um, a core, uh, we need a <coughs> as a summation of the partial uh, results. That's the correct solution. That was pretty quick. Yes, question? Good question. Is there a reason why I do not declare x in the for loop? The only reason is for teaching purposes. If I would declare it, you wouldn't have to come up with private x. That's equivalent. So I can also declare x within the, the for loop. Any other questions? Yes? Okay, the question is, can I make sum last private? So last private would mean I have sum as a private variable and the value of the last iteration for i equals num intervals will be written back to the main thread. But only the value of the last iteration from one thread. So then, then we would lose the partial results of the other threads. It would also approximate p, but it would be further off. <laughs> Good. And yeah, so that's that's my solution. Ah, sorry. What do you expect the scalability to be? Is it good? Is it bad? Hmm? It it depends. Yeah, that's a that's a fair answer. Never wrong. So on what does it depend? Huh? <laughs> okay. So. What what do would you expect with four threads on a four core laptop? Depends on the number of intervals. Good question. With two intervals, I don't get a speed up. Right. So assuming I have a million of intervals. Close to four. Yes, absolutely. So there's really nothing stopping the uh, uh, the speed up here. So that's on an old machine with eight cores, I get an almost linear speed up. So there's nothing else except for printing out, uh, this is my approximation of pi. There's just one parallel region, there's virtually no overhead, only at the end the number of threads, partial intervals are added up and I mean it's really a trivial uh, problem. Okay, so that's about it with my introduction. That's just some help for the uh, exercises here, we offer make files. Uh, I think there are targets like, uh, it's not a file, so it's like build and run or something like that, or maybe debug, showing the different compiler options if you have any questions working on the exercises. Uh, uh, all our people are available to help you.